think there's supposed to be four people in this class, so we'll give it a little bit just to see if anyone else shows up. Um, and then considering that uh, we started this class late, uh, missing um, you know two classes. Um, what we're what we're gonna do is we'll probably uh have to um like we'll probably have to like make up a class during um the uh what is it during the weeks of Labor Day or like Thanksgiving, but uh but we'll we'll figure that out, I guess. And then, Sophia, is this your first time with me? It should be, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay, okay. So I guess while, you know, while we're waiting, I may as well just go ahead and start talking. Um, so if this is your first time with me, um, I do, I should kind of, you know, go ahead and kind of talk about a little bit. Um, so the way that I plan on running this class, right, is um, I plan on, you know, asking you guys the questions and then having you guys kind of explain things. Um, I'll always make sure to start by, you know, explaining maybe like the basic idea behind something, right? Uh, I don't want to, you know, throw you into something and have you come up with the definitions or whatever, right? I'm not going to do that, right? I'll give you the definitions that you need. And then um, if I think it's a problem that you can do at that point, right, I will I will ask you to do it, right? Um, some questions will be, um, you know, more proof-based, um, some questions will be more application based. Uh, it just depends. Um, but uh, I think the application based ones, right? You guys can do more of. I will. I will take on more of the proof based ones, um, specifically because proofs in calculus start becoming much harder than they used to be. Um, so, um, with all that being said, um, you know, I guess uh, this class, right, we'll be going through the calculus um, art of problem solving book. Um, and the point of this class is we're supposed to be trying to go through the um, BC calculus material. And uh, let me just kind of screen share, I guess, while I'm talking about it. Um, so the BC calculus material goes through uh, pretty much all of the chapters in this book. Um, so sets and functions is sort of like an introductory section, you know, just making sure that you guys understand things like domain and range. Limits and continuity, derivatives, applications of derivatives, integration. This is huge and long. This is probably going to take us like two months. Uh, infinity and then differential equations. This is the AB material. And then the two chapters of series and plane curves. These are, uh, this is material that you will find in the BC class only. So we'll go through um, chapters one through six and then chapter nine. We'll skip seven and eight to start and then we'll go back and finish seven and eight. Um, because, you know, focus on getting the AB material in first, then, you know, turn back and get the BC material, right? Um, I'm trying to think of some things. Um, one thing about this book that's different from the prior, uh, 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 Art of Problem Solving books. Actually, I don't think any of you guys have taken a uh, regular class with me. I think most of you guys are, uh, I think the other two of you guys here, uh, only took the, um, SAT class. But uh, normally the way that the art of problem solving book works is they sh they like list all the problems one by one and then they list the solutions. Problem with this book is they just go ahead and directly list the problems and then the solutions afterwards, like one at a time. So it's really difficult for me to be able to, you know, like get a screenshot of just the problems. So I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, you know, just kind of, you know, reading through here, right? And then um, if you guys need me to write it out, just let me know and then I'll bring it over to like a whiteboard, okay? Um, yeah, I mean, that's roughly about it here. Um, I, mean, I guess a couple other things are like, you know, uh, if you need to use the restroom or whatever, right, just go, just let me know you're gone. Um, but uh, if, um, if uh, you, you know, you're late or can't answer any questions or whatever, right, for any reason, let me know, right? It's not a big deal. Um, but yeah, like the main reason why I make you guys answer questions, um, is because I think it's just easier that way. Um, because I think it gives me a better idea of like what your understanding is. Right. And it gives me an, a way to understand like, you know, how you're, uh, you know, how you're, uh, 
trying to think about a question, right? What directions you're, you know, looking towards and things like that, right? Gives me an idea as to like what you're thinking about. Um, but yeah. Um, you know, normally I would, you know, tell the little kids like, you know, things about like face cams or whatever, but I think you guys are fine. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna require you guys to turn on cameras. Um it's not I don't think it's important. Um and then I think um Apart from that, uh, we do record every class. So if you're, um, you know, unable to make it or have to show up late or whatever, right? Not a big deal. Just watch the recording for the parts that you miss. Um, but yeah, that's uh, pretty much about it. I guess just to make sure, um, uh, what's the highest level of mathematics that you guys have all finished before? I'm just, I'm just double checking. Um, so lot level that you guys have finished. So if you're currently in a class, that that won't count, I guess. I'm. We can just start from the top and go down. Um, I think Preston is can't answer right now, but um, or you can just you know send it in the chat. Uh, pre calc. Okay. And then um, Sophia. I don't. I don't have like a specific class name. It was just like math three at my high school, but I think um, it's like pre calc and stuff. Okay. Wait, so I guess what class are you currently in? Then? If you guys have finished pre-cal already, are you guys in calculus right now? I'm going to take BC Calc like this school year. Oh, has your school year not started? No. Oh, it's, okay, okay. It starts in a few weeks, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. And then um, Jocelyn, is that true for you as well then? Yeah, I took accelerated pre-cal. Okay, so you will be taking calculus upcoming, right? Oh, I'm taking it right now. Oh, okay, okay. And then um Preston, same for you. You got you guys are all in calc. You're doing calc A B. Okay, okay. So if you guys are all in calculus right now, that makes things actually a lot easier because I can kind of ignore a lot of the intro stuff, right? Because the idea would be that you guys are learning this introductory stuff in schools already, right? Um so I can I can kind of skip this. We can kind of skip the entirety of chapter one. And then I can kind of just go forward to the important parts, the ones that the ones that are important and the ones that you will probably struggle in, right? Um, so we can we can focus on that instead. And I think that's a better use of our time. Are you guys all good with that? Like basically, instead of me teaching the full material, just focus on the things that you guys will probably need more help in. Then um, and then just you know do that. Does that sound good to you guys? Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's good. Okay, okay. Um, I guess just to clarify, so so Sophia, you haven't started yet, but then Preston and Jocelyn, both of you guys have. Um, what topic are you guys currently at in um in calc in your calc class? It probably started for like a week or two, right? Oh, uh, we're on the derivative. You're two already four. on derivatives. Oh yeah, <laughs> we yeah. started school on August seventh. So. Oh, so it's been like three weeks. Okay. Um, did you learn about limits at all? Yeah, we just finished that limit unit. We had a test on it too. What did you What did you learn about when it came to limits? Like, how did you learn about it? Did you learn about the algebraic approach, or did you learn the epsilon delta approach? Uh, I think the Wait, first does, one. Does, does does epsilon delta mean anything to you? Uh, I don't think we went through that, or I don't think okay. we went to the squeeze theorem either. Okay. 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 All right. That's what I expected then. Yeah. Okay, um, because there's no way that you guys went through epsilon delta if you guys are already on derivatives. Okay. Um, and then Preston, um, when you get a chance, let me know as well, okay? Um, oh, haven't started school yet? Okay, okay. All right, so then, not, so two of you guys haven't really started. One of you guys already in derivatives. Okay. Um, all right, so we don't have to worry about limits too much um i think i can i think it's okay if i just kind of you know roughly explain that and then just go into derivatives because you know i kind of need to uh talk about that right otherwise you know you're not going to be learning too much new here okay um so let's kind of talk about this a little bit so um sophia and preston have you guys learned about limits before or do, do you guys know what that is or no yeah, we kind of covered it like last year. Yeah, in pre-cal. Yeah, usually it's a topic that gets covered in pre-cal. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Usually it's a topic that gets covered in pre-cal. So hopefully this is something that you guys are already familiar with. 
Um, but sometimes it's a topic that doesn't get covered in pre-cal, so, which is why I'm you know, just double checking, right? So you guys should be familiar with the idea that for a limit, when I say limit as you know, like X approaches A of F of X, if this is equal to L, the idea is that your Y coordinate gets closer and closer to L as your X coordinate gets closer and closer to A. So for that idea, right? This idea, you know, seems as if it's not really that important, right? It's like, you know, why would you ever really care about this? And to be really honest, you don't. Typically um, in an actual function, you don't really care about this. Uh, you don't really use this very much. Sometimes you'll use it for, um, you know, for when your function is uh, discontinuous, but that's a, you know, that's a uh, topic that you guys need to learn about in uh, limits. Um, specifically, it's very helpful when you have a hole in a function, but I mean, even then, right? Why would you really care about it, right? It's not, it's not like something that, you know, that you really have to use. It turns out that a limit on its own for an actual function, not very helpful. What you really care about, however, is limits to two things. Number one, limit to infinity is one really important idea. And the second one is the application of a limit. And the idea is that you would use a limit um, you know, in certain situations, and that would give you a better approach to certain things. Now, what does that mean? Let's take, for example, a function. So let's say your function is something along the lines of this, right? So this is a, uh, you know, this is like a what? A cubic function, right? Um, so the idea here is, let's say you are really interested in the, the rate of change of your function, right? So the idea here is, well, we've talked about average rate of change before, right? So um, I guess to start things off, um, Sophia, do you know what the average rate of change is and how does that work? Um, I don't. You don't? Okay. Jocelyn, you should know. It's like the overall uh, change in y over change in x over the period. Right. Over, this, over a certain period of time, right? So let's say, for example, you wanted to find the average rate of change between, say, for example, these two points, right? So the first idea is you would take two points, right? And then you would find a difference in your y coordinates, find a difference in your x coordinates, and then divide, right? It's simply just your slope. So average rate of change simply just refers to slope between two points. Sophia, does that sound better? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, right. And this is something that you typically get asked about on the SAT exam. And that's why I know that you, you guys should know about this, right? So the idea here is this right here would be my average rate of change. However, if I you know start bringing the second point right closer and closer and closer to this point over here, I'm going to get a more and more and more accurate rate of change at this one specific point, right? So what does this sort of mean? Well, let's say, for example, that this graph is more than just an xy graph. Let's say that they actually sort of represent some things, right? So let's say, for example, that, um, you know, your, uh, let's say, for example, that your y-axis here represents your speed. And then your x-axis here represents time. OK, so if I you know, have a speed of this, and then I increase to a speed of this, what is this rate of change called? What is this word that we use here? Jocelyn, do you know? Um, not exactly. It's not going to my head right now. Sophia? I'm not super sure either. Not sure. It's called acceleration, right? Because the speed at which you change your the rate at which you change your speed, that's called your acceleration, right? So this is your average acceleration over this period of time. That's going to be really important when you guys do physics. Um, but the idea is that that's sort of like where this is going towards. Um, now, so if this is your acceleration, right? Well, clearly, you know. At this current specific moment in time, right? At this specific moment in time, you're actually decreasing in speed, right? You are actually, you know, um, you have a negative acceleration. But what this is suggesting here is that you actually have a positive one, right? And why is that the case? Because you've taken too long of a period of time. So the idea here is, well, if you want to get a very, very accurate um, average, you know, average acceleration or very, very accurate instantaneous acceleration, like to find your acceleration at this specific time, what you want to do is you want to bring this point closer and closer and closer to this point over here. 
Does that make sense so far? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So what you're looking to do is effectively, you want to find exactly what the slope of this graph is at this specific point. But the problem is, it seems impossible because, well, if you try doing that, right, this would be, well, you know, uh, your y coordinates, right, would be f of x. And then if I had a second point over here, right, minus f of, you know, let's, uh, let's call this x1 and x2 over x1 minus x2, right? So that's the idea here, right? So this one over here would be x, x1, uh, <clears throat> x1, f of x1. This one over here would be um, <clears throat> x2, f of x2, right? So the idea here is, well, if you, you know, do actually bring them over to the same point, you would get zero over zero, which seems impossible because it is. So the question at this point is, well, how do we do it? And here is exactly how. What you're going to do is you're going to set up, instead of x1 and x2, you're going to say the difference between these two points is, let's say, h. So this is going to be f of x plus h minus f of x, all divided by x plus h minus x. And the way this works is you take this with a limit as h approaches 0. That's our goal. So let's say hypothetically, right? Let's say as an example that this function up here, right? Let's say that this was, I don't know, um, 4x cubed minus 3x squared plus 4. OK, just an example, right? So what you would do at this point is you would take x plus h, plug that in, subtract away when x gets plugged in, and then divide by this. Now, this one ends up being quite difficult because there's a pretty annoying 3x squared term. But just to show you what that would end up being, um, 4x cubed times this is um, 4x to the power of 3 uh, plus 12x squared, um, 12x squared h plus 12x h squared plus or uh, h cubed. All right, so that's the first one. Then you have your 3x squared term, so minus um, 3x squared minus uh, 6xh minus 3h squared, and then plus 4, right? So that's, uh, that's this for this. And then you subtract away f of x, which is, well, minus 4x cubed plus 3x squared minus 4. Look good so far? Have I lost any of you? Yeah, it looks good. So then yeah, at this point, good. okay. So then at this point, you'll see that this cancels, this cancels, and this cancels, leaving you with only terms that include h. So when you realize that this is being divided by, well, h, it's as simple as just canceling out your h. So h goes away, h squared goes away, this becomes h squared, this goes away, that goes away, that goes away. So you're left with 12x squared plus 12xh minus, oh, sorry, plus 4h squared minus 6x minus 3h. And remember, limit as h approaches 0. So your final answer is 12x squared plus or uh, minus 6x, because this is 0, this is 0, this is 0. And that's it. And then whatever your value of x was over here, you can simply just plug it in into here, and you'll find your answer. This is a derivative. So a derivative is effectively the instantaneous rate of change. And if you think about the rate of change in terms of speed, acceleration, whatnot, um, your position, right? If you take the derivative of a position, this is a derivative sign, by the way. Um, so this is like position derivative, right? This becomes speed. And if you do the same thing to speed, rate of change of your speed is acceleration. 
it turns out that you can keep going and i think they're called like uh like it's called um i can't remember but it, it's like something and then the next three are like snap crackle pop um but uh snap crackle pop but um i think the next one's like um uh, starts with a j i can't remember exactly what it is um but that's but don't worry about it too much but this is this is the most important part so again right so basically the idea behind a derivative is at this one specific spot the the uh, slope of the line that would be perpendicular sorry that would be tangent to this graph would have the slope of whatever this is when you plug in x so this is the approach this is the formula this is the limit approach to a derivative and how you'd find it but we'll we'll find out that there's a much faster shortcut Any questions so far? Okay. So if you want to find tangent lines, right, there are other approaches, but we're just, you know, we're just focusing on the, the most important idea here, right? Okay. <clears throat> so um F so the again, right, the notation here is F prime of A means the derivative of f at x equals a. All right. So let's give you guys a little bit more straightforward of an example. So let's say we have f of x is equal to x squared. Let's find the tangent line. at um x uh at one comma one all right um sophia can you do can you do this example here so this is your function and we want to find this tangent line at this point here what do you mean like find the tangent line so the idea here is that this function if i were to graph this out right this would look like a parabola right yeah okay so the parabola looks something along the lines of this. One comma one is this point right here, perhaps. Yeah. You want to find what line, what the equation of this line is, like y equals mx plus b. Okay. So you already know the point here. You just need to find the slope. And then from there, you'd be able to find the equation of the line, right? And what did we say about the slope? What is that equal to? Um, It's the formula above. Yeah, the derivative, right? Yeah. So as of right now, this is the only approach that we have for a derivative. So we have mm -hmm. to use this approach, right? Mm -hmm. Do you remember what the formula was? Well, isn't it just, the, like I wrote it down. Like okay. The, okay. <laughs> yeah, sir. <laughs> what is it? F of like x plus h minus f of x over x plus h minus x. Yep. Yeah. And then what I is there in front of in... all this? Sorry? What is, what is there in front of all of this? Uh, limit of h is to zero. Yeah. Limit as h approaches zero of this whole thing, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, One small detail uh, for now. Do you actually know what the value of x is? Is it the, well, is it the point? Like the x, x is the x point? Coordinate. It is, it is. Because okay. when you think about it on the graph, right, this is this is your one one, right, and then the plus h refers to the second point that you pick for the slope, right. So mm -hmm. it is it is going to be the one. Now it's okay if you plug it in now. It's okay if you plug it in later. It doesn't really matter. So we we don't have to worry about it just yet. Okay. So let's plug in. What did we get? Okay. So, or should I find h now or h first, or does it matter? Um. Should you find h now? Um, h is approaching zero, so there's not any reason to find the value of h. Oh, okay, I see. So I just I can just plug it. So I just okay. So f of what I just do f of one plus h and then minus f of one and then sure that works. Okay. So plugging in x equals one basically. Yeah. Okay. And then you can take out the ones at the denominator. Sure. So this gives you limit as 
h approaches zero of f of one plus h minus f of one, all divided by just h. Okay, and what now? Um, I'm not super sure. Like, what would I? Well, what do you know about f of x? It's oh, it's also equal to one. Well, f of one is just one, yeah. But yeah. what do you know about the whole equation of f of x? It's x squared. Uh -huh. So if you have f of 1 plus h, can't you take this 1 plus h and plug it in? Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. Up here? Yeah, so I can just square that. So this becomes? Let's um, expand it. Okay, h squared plus 2h plus 1, um, and then minus 1. Oh, so h squared plus 2h over h. Um, and what can you do right here? You can just divide so you get h plus 2. What is this? Um, you should know this. Come on, you know this. You very much know this. <laughs> so then would it just be 2? Yes. So your, okay. slope, your slope at this point would be 2 because the derivative was equal to 2. That's it. That's okay. Exactly it. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. So then from here, you have your slope, you have your points, you can find the equation of the line, right? I'm not going to make you do that. Okay. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So remember, keep in mind, always, 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 this is super important, right? The derivative of an equation, right? At a specific point is the slope at that specific point. You can find a general format for the derivative. That's okay. Right. That does work. Right? As you can see here, right, this was our equation. This is the general format of the derivative. If you plug in your coordinate of x, it will give you back the slope at the, of the original function, wherever it is. And then the same deal here, right? Had we chosen to use x plus h instead, right, your equation would have been simply just 2x. And then from there, we would have said, oh, you know, you can just plug in x equals 1, right? So Personally, I like to keep the x until the very end and then plug in for x at the end, right? Just because that, you know, gives you a bit more of a sort of like a, in my opinion, a bit of a, you know, better way to use it. But that's, um, but that's the idea here. Now, um, a couple things. Um, number one, it turns out there's actually a lot more than just uh, the one way that I'm showing it here for derivative, right? I will typically write this because I am lazy and this is the one that I'm familiar with. Um, but there are a couple other definitions that I think you will always see. One of them is um, a capital D f of x. This one is also derivative. You'll sometimes see this. Um, you'll probably see this in like textbooks here and there. But the most, most common one that um, can be quite confusing sometimes is these two approaches. Number one, df over dx and number two d over dx of f of x these two are sometimes a little bit confusing because why do i have a what seems like a division right that seems really really weird so let me roughly explain this to you so the idea here <clears throat> the idea here is you are taking the derivative of f of x that's what this df on the numerator part means, right? You're, you're taking the derivative of f of x. Now, what does this denominator here mean? What the denominator here is, is it's, it's sort of an identifier. It kind of tells you what is a variable here. Now, <clears throat> you might be asking, why is that necessary? And valid point, right? Well, the idea here is if your x is a variable, everything else is a constant. Now, this doesn't really matter here as much. It matters a lot more once we start using multiple, multiple variables. Um, and that's something that we'll talk about when we get when we eventually reach something called implicit differentiation. Just hold this idea in mind for now. We're not going to use it very much. And if I gave you an example right now, it would be very confusing. So for now, just remember that this is a possible um, this is like a possible way to write it, but for now, just this will be okay. And I'll be frankly honest, I only, I've only ever written this before. I'm actually, 
not at all familiar with how to write this, but um, but keep just keep in mind that the derivative here sort of tells you what your variable is. Okay. Any questions so far? No. Okay. Now, um, Jocelyn, if you went over limits, you should know what the definition of continuity is, right? Yeah. So what does that mean? Can you roughly explain it? Uh, so continuity is where like, uh, it like there are no holes in the graph, like you can draw the function without picking up your pencil. That's a very good way. To, that's a very good way to describe it, right? Um, and that's a really good way to kind of like you know have a good picture as to what it means, right? So what this means is like there's no holes, there's no jumps, right? There's no gaps like in the middle. Right, so if you were if you're drawing this out with the, with the pencil, right, you would you would not have to pick up your pencil, right? Is this a definition that your teacher gave you, or is this a definition that I gave you? Oh, that was just something I just thought of. <laughs> oh, something you thought of? Because I know that every single time I explain this, I always say this, so I'm I'm not sure. Um, yeah, this is one that this is this is the way that I always I always explain it to people. Oh, but yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. but it turns out um there's actually a more uh like mathematically defined definition and that is that for a for a function that is continuous you will find that f of x is equal to the limit uh well i guess f of a is a better way to put it f of a is equal to the limit as x approaches a of f of x or in other words the function the value at that specific point is equal to the limit to that specific point so that's that's another way to put it right so for a continuous function, this will be true so long as, you know, it's in a continuous portion. So functions can be partially continuous, so or continuous for a certain interval, and then, you know, discontinuous in a different spot, right? That's perfectly allowable, um, but that's what we're seeing here. <clears throat> so sometimes, right, um, it is impossible to get, uh, you know, sometimes it is impossible to get um, a derivative. A function is only uh derivable a function you can only take the derivative of a function when it is continuous so sometimes it's you can take the derivative for some values but not for other values right so that's uh that's a really important idea here so differenti differentiability implies continuity that's a super super important idea now if you you know want to fully show this proof the idea is basically you know, we can start with, for example, limit as um, h approaches 0 of f of a plus h, right? And the idea is this is equal to the limit as h approaches 0, because this is, you know, the limit of f of a, right? Supposedly. So this is equal to the limit of f of a plus h minus f of a plus f of a. You might be wondering why do I need to, you know, why do I need to subtract away and add a? You know, we'll talk about that in just a second. So this gets you the limit <clears throat> as h approaches zero. You'll notice that this looks very similar to a, uh, you know, the um, the derivative formula, and it is. So this is um, limit as h approaches zero of f of a plus h minus f of a over h times h plus f of a so you know just getting it closer and closer to look like you know what we what we want it to look like right and then so this becomes the derivative of f of x so f prime of a times the limit as h approaches zero of h plus f of a <clears throat> now notice that this is a constant value at this point right because there's no h involved in it at all so then from here what it tells you is <clears throat> if you have um limit as a uh, limit of f of a sorry limit as h approaches zero of f of a plus h right this is just equal to f of a because this is just equal to zero because this is zero right here so <clears throat> what does this mean? This is basically just, <clears throat> this is, this right here 
is limit as x approaches a of f of a. These two are the same thing, right? Because the idea here is that you know your x coordinate gets closer and closer and closer to a, right? Well, that's exactly what's going on here. That's the same deal. These two are the same. So it turns out that this equaling f of a is continuity. And this right here, right? If the if the if the um, function is continuous, right, then you will get a derivative. So that's the general idea here. So if you have a continuous function, then it will be, you know, you have a derivative, right? If you have a derivative, then it's continuous. Okay. Um, any questions here? Well, if you have, <clears throat> sorry, sorry, I should, I should, I should be a little bit more clear about this. So, if you have a derivative, it will always be continuous. However, just because it's continuous, doesn't mean you have a derivative. Yeah, that's that's the better way to put it, right? You need to be continuous in order to have a derivative, but just because you are continuous doesn't mean you will be. You know, you will have a derivative, okay? And I think that might seem a little bit confusing. So let's give you an example of when this doesn't work. So let's say for, for an example here, the absolute value of x function. So let's look at the derivative of f of x when x is greater than 0. OK. Um, Jocelyn, just really quickly, what would this be equal to? Wait, sorry, can you repeat that? There was so, something in the background. So this is your function here. f of x is equal to the absolute value of x. What is the derivative of f of x while x is greater than 0? Um, 1. Yeah, right? We don't, we don't need to take the, uh, you know, the limit approach, right? It's just equal to 1 because the slope is just one, right? What about when x is less than zero? Negative one. What about when x is equal to zero? Zero? This or... one's undefined. Oh, wait. Oh, OK. Now, the reason why this is undefined is because um, basically your slope, right? Your slope actually instantly changes from negative one to positive one. So it's undefined at this specific moment, at this specific point of x equals 0. Um, that's roughly the idea here, which makes it, um, you know, which makes it, uh, you know, it's also one way to think about it is it's a 0, 0 situation. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this is undefined. Now, if you really want to go into it and, like, show the whole proof, you would have to use the limit approach, right? This would be limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h, right? Because you get x plus h minus x. So this is absolute value of x plus h minus absolute value of x over h. Well, this is just absolute value of h over h, right? So then from here. Um, this is, you know, this is where things get really annoying because when H is zero, it's just zero or zero. Does that sound better? Yeah. Sort of. Okay. But yeah. Um, that's pretty much about it here. Cause remember X is equal to zero in this situation, right? So zero plus H minus zero. So. All right. So. The idea here, right, is if you have something like a sharp corner or all of a sudden your, you know, your slope instantly changes because of a piecewise function or something like that, right? Those are your two most common situations in which you won't have a derivative, right? But if it's a smooth curve, right? If it's a smooth curve, no piecewise definitions, you should have a derivative. That's the idea here. Any questions here? Okay, let's look at another example. So this one was pretty quick. Um, how about f of x is equal to the cube root of x? So 
what is the derivative of f of x here? Have you actually learned about this yet? Jocelyn, do you know how to take a derivative yet? Uh, a little bit, yeah. A little bit? So do you know what this is already? I'm just curious. Um, I think it's, it's like, wait, is it one third x to the negative? Uh, two thirds? Yeah, negative two thirds. Yeah, it is. Um, so let's have you explain it. Um, so did you, did you actually prove this or did you just like, did your teachers just tell you, this is how you take a derivative, you multiply by what the power is and then you subtract one. Did they just tell you or? Did oh no, we haven't got there yet. It's because in the summer I kind of previewed it a little ah, bit. Ah, okay, okay. But yeah, they're teaching the long definition. So they're they're teaching it with the with the limits and everything, right? The yeah. Same way I'm doing here. Okay. Well, I'm telling you this right now. Um, from basically as soon as you learn this approach, you'll never you'll never look back. Like, you should never have to use the limit approach ever again. Right. <laughs> okay. So here's roughly how this works. So let me show you this proof first. So we'll come back to this in a moment. Okay, so let's say, for example, you have something in the format of f of x is equal to x to the power of n. Okay, um, so the idea here is we want to find what the derivative of this is. So f prime of x is equal to, well, hold on. So normally we have to use the limit approach, right? Limit as h approaches 0 of x plus h to the power of n minus x to the power of n all divided by h, right? Well, let me ask you this. Do you know what the expansion of this would be? Jocelyn? Do you know what this expansion uh, is? Like that? I mean, like x to the n power, and then what you mean? Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Like what, what would you have here, basically? Well, x to the n power plus 2xh. That's if it was squared. Oh wait. <laughs> um H X plus oh, wait two wait. <laughs> um uh, not exactly after. Okay. Um Sophia, do you know what's supposed to follow? Um I'm not sure. So this is actually um, this actually comes from what's called the binomial theorem. Maybe you guys have seen Pascal's triangle before. I know this sounds really, really off topic, but just hold on. I'll, I'll bring it back. It goes 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4. You guys have seen this before, right? Not the first time seeing it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it turns out that if you have something in the format of a plus b to the power of 0, you get 1. a plus b to the power of 1, obviously your coefficients are 1 and 1. a plus b to the power of 2, your coefficients are 1, 2, 1, right? a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. If you have a plus b cubed, your coefficients are 1, 3, 3, 1, right? a cubed plus 3a squared b plus 3ab squared plus b cubed. So... These would be the coefficients when you have a plus b to the fourth power, right? Now, it turns out that these numbers here are actually combinations. This is this is uh, 4 choose 0, 4 choose 1, 4 choose 2, 4 choose 3, and 4 choose 4. So the idea is that your coefficients all the way down, for example, in a plus b to the power of n equation are n choose 0 times a to the power of n plus n choose 1 times a to the power of n minus 1 b plus n choose 2 times a to the power of n minus 2 times b squared, so on and so forth, all the way down. This is the binomial theorem. And the easiest way to remember it is it's just the numbers in Pascal's triangle, row for row. You guys ever seen this before? Yeah, I've seen it a long time ago. It was in Algebra 2. That's where you should have seen it, actually. Yeah. yeah. Ring a bell now? 
So the idea yeah. here is that this is going to be x to the power of n plus, well, it turns out that n choose, n choose 1 is actually simply a very simple to do. Because you'll notice it's just increasing by 1 each time. So this is plus n times x to the power of n minus 1 times h. And then the rest are pretty undeterminable, right? Does that look good so far, Jocelyn? Yeah. OK. So then from here, we agree that when you subtract x to the power of n, this is going to cancel, right? But let me ask you, you can only find what this is. You can't find the rest. So why is it that none of the rest matters? Why um, is it that none of this will matter? Is it because you only need to know like for the limit as getting closer? Like, I don't really know. Mm, I would say pretty far off. It's not, uh, it does not, it does have to do with the limit, but not for the reason that you're suggesting. Sophia, do you see it? Um, I'm not sure. I was going to say something about the limit, but I don't like know specifically. Okay. Um, I guess Sophia, we'll turn this over to you then. So let me ask you this. As you go further and further and further into this, into this expansion, what happens to the power of X? Also, Preston, are you still driving? 40 minutes? Jeez. Okay. Um, so, but what happens to the power of x as you go over and over and over? Um, it gets larger. The power of x? Or it gets oh the the power decreases. Yeah, so the power of x would decrease smaller and smaller, right? Because yeah. you know, that's how this works, right? The power of x decreases as you move over. And the power of h would increase. Right. So if your power of h is increasing, you agree with me that everything else past here has only higher and higher powers of h, correct? Yeah. So then it would contradict. No, oh, it would contradict. That means everything here is divisible by h, yes? Yeah. So when you divide through by h, this h cancels. But what happens to everything else over here? Well, it would only be divided by 1h, so, so it would only lose one power. Right, so they would still have h in them, correct? Mm -hmm. And what does h approach? Oh, okay. So zero, and then, so the rest is like canceled. Not canceled, yeah. zero. So this is equal to n times x to the power of n minus 1. Okay. Makes sense now? Yeah, it makes sense. Jocelyn, you too? Yeah. So it turns out that this, right, if you have x to the power of n, the derivative of that is simply just x to the power of, well, n times x to the power of n minus 1, right? So the way that I always tell people, right, is multiply by what the power is, then decrease the power by 1. Simple as that. And it turns out that this uh, also works for when you have fractions and negative numbers. So it doesn't actually matter, no matter what the exponent of x is. You can simply just do this. Sound good? Yeah. Now, uh, sorry. So now, you might be asking, why do we know that this works for you know negative exponents or, or whatever, right? How do we know that it also works? Um. That is, <laughs> that's a problem for another day. Um, but what I'm going to, basically all I'm going to say is like, you know, we've proven this for positive integer, you know, positive integer uh, examples. Proving it for the rest is, you know, stuff for another day, right? Okay. So now that we go back here, that's where this comes from, right? You can simply just say, hey, this is x to the power of one third right? Multiply by what the power currently is, then decrease it by one, and that leads you to this answer here. Look good? Yep. So this idea right here, from now on, 
is going to be the way that you're going to do derivatives. Now, unless your question like directly dictates, hey, use the limit definition of a derivative, right? In which case you would have to go through all of this all over again, right? Unless you're told specifically to do that, this is the way that you guys are going to be doing it from now on, okay? All okay. right. Okay, yeah. So go ahead and, uh, you know, if you haven't memorized it yet, this is, this is going to be super important. This is like the foundation of all your derivatives, basically. Okay. Let's look at another proof that we care about. So let's say, for example, you have something along the lines of two functions being added together. So you might be familiar with the uh, with the notation of f plus g of x. This simply just means f of x plus g of x. So let's see what the derivative of f plus g of x is equal to. All right. So, Sophia, how am I going to do this? Would it just be the like f of like the derivative of f of x plus the derivative of g of x? So the way that I would read this, right, is f prime of x plus g prime of x. Um, if okay. you can't, if I'm not, uh, you know, if you can't hear specifically, the word is prime, right? So, um, this right here is prime. Now, I do agree with you. This does end up being correct. However, you need a proof. What's the proof? Um, so the proof is you'd have to do it with limits. So you'd set up the limits from here, right? The, all of this, all of these limits, and then you'd eventually get it. Sound good? Wait, so I would just like, oh, just so I would, okay. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you what this ends up looking like. This ends up being um, f plus g of x plus h minus f plus g of x over h, right? And then limit as h approaches 0, as always, right? And then the idea is just split this out as f of x plus h min uh, plus g of x plus h, right? And then split this out as f of x plus g of x. Okay. And then the idea is, okay, you get this minus this, and then you get that minus that, split those out into two separate fractions, and then you get derivative of f plus derivative of g. Sound good? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Now, what's the important part of behind all of this? Well, what this means is basically now, if I give you something like, you know, let's go back to this example back up here, right? Um, This formula up here. Let's let's you know say we want to find a derivative of four x cubed minus three x squared plus four. What would what what would you say the derivative is now? Sophia. Oh, sorry, I wasn't sure if you were asking. Very good. Um. So would I just like. Should I just plug it back into the? Well, you don't have to use the limit approach anymore, because we, you know, showed you a new way to do that. Yeah, but but then wouldn't I have to? Because because it's that's for like x to n, or would it just be like you're fine? Oh, oh, your question is, what do we do with the four, right? Is yeah, that, is that your question? Okay, okay. Or is it like, are we separate? I don't know. Sorry. Yeah. No worries, no worries. It's a good question actually, um, because we didn't explain it. Um, so remember how we said f plus g prime is equal to f prime plus g prime, right? Yeah. So I'm not I'm not writing the x at this point, but you get the idea that these are functions, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what would what would f plus f prime represent? This is the same thing as two f prime, right? Yeah. Okay. According to this, what is it equal to? Um, what do you, like, if, if I, if I use this approach here, what would this be equal to? Oh, F prime plus F prime. 
which you agree would be two times f prime, right? Yeah. You see where this is going, right? Yeah. So, so it's the... being multiplied. Oh. No. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. So if it's being multiplied by a by a uh, coefficient, does it change anything? No. No. Right. So you just keep that coefficient in later on. Okay. So. So one last thing, right? So if we go back to this formula here, and we where is it? Where is it? If, so if we if we go back to this formula here, right, and we you know sort of change it a little bit, if we have an a in front, we simply just have an a right here, and that's it. It doesn't need it. Okay. Yeah, that's all. Okay, and then for like, cause it's, I guess it's is it like it's three separate. Sorry, f of this... x plus g of x plus h of x. You're exactly right. Okay, okay. Sorry, yeah. I wasn't sure. No, no, no. That's all good questions. Right? It's all it's all good to you know to make sure that you have it right. Yeah, that's exactly it. Okay, so it would be four x squared. Four um, x squared. Well, isn't it? Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, twelve. There you go. Squared. Um, and would it be plus or? I guess it would still be. Minus, right? So this is a coefficient of negative three. That's a, that's absolutely right. Okay, so negative minus six x, um, and then plus. Okay. Would it be plus one? Hold on, sorry. Does this explain it more? Okay, so. Oh, so would it be one over four? Because x. Remember, you multiply by what the exponent currently is. So then just nothing. And that matches our answer. Oh, okay, I see. I see. Okay. Any questions on that? Sorry, can you just scroll up again? I just want to. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Though. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Jocelyn look good to you as well. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea here is when you you know when you have something like this, right? You just go down the line, right? Take the derivative of each individual. Uh, what, what actually? Do you know what we call these? Uh, Jocelyn, do you know what we call these? Terms. Yeah, you take the derivative of each individual term and then just you know throw them all together, right? So let's go back here. Um, let's say we have the following few examples, um, and then you guys can kind of just, you know, each do like two of these, I guess, right? So x to the power of 3 minus 2x squared plus 6x minus 9. Um, and then let's have you also do 2x plus 3 to the power of 3. Okay, so what would the derivative of this be, Jocelyn? Well, both of these. Uh, the first one's... Uh... 3x squared minus 4x uh, plus 6. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. The minus 9 goes away. You're exactly right. Okay. And then? This uh, one. I don't know. Is there like an easier way instead of like multiplying it out? There is, but you haven't learned what you need for it yet. So as of right now, what do you need to do? Um, like multiply it out, I guess, and then find each one. Or okay. So, um... so 8x cubed plus 36x squared. I'm not going to make you do this. Plus 54x plus 27. And then from here. And then it's uh, 24x squared plus uh, 72x plus 54. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, if you if you went ahead and like learned a little bit of this before, um, have you have you heard of the product chain and quotient rules? Uh, I think kind of. But I didn't go too into it. Okay. This is an example of the chain rule, and we'll talk about this um, in an upcoming section, maybe somewhat soon, but yeah, this is, a, this is an example of that. 
So really, really important that you don't just, you know, decrease the power of this and then say, oh, this becomes, you know, three times this squared. It remember, it only works that that formula, right? Only, only works when you have <laughs> when you have something in the format of a times x to the power of n. It only ever works then, right? This is an x plus two times x plus three, right? That's not just x alone anymore, right? So you can't just simply, oh, you know, like that's all I have to do, right? It doesn't work like that anymore. Right. Um, but yeah, good catch. And then, um, okay, so two more examples here. So Sophia, these two will be yours. Um, how about three x to the power of eleven minus five x to the power of nine plus one eighty eight x, and then five over x to the power of seven. Um, minus two over x plus three minus eight x to the power of four. Okay. Um. So the first one would be. Um, thirty three x to the ten. Minus. Um, forty five x, to the, eight. Plus, um, would it just be plus 188? Yeah. Okay. And a second. Um, sorry, one thing. Or should I, would I, like, when it's like, when it, when the power is like a fraction, would you rather I make it like a negative exponent? Do whatever you need to to get the question right. Okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Um. Okay. So I guess are you negative? Are you rewriting it? Aren't you? So what's yeah. The, so what did you rewrite this to? Five x to the negative seven. Mm -hmm. Okay. So minus two x to the negative one plus three yeah. minus eight x to the power of four. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. So it would be negative thirty five x to the negative eight. Mm -hmm. And then. Um. So neg or plus two. Yeah. Plus two to the x 2x minus to the negative 2 and then um so it would be zero oh then zero and then and then um Oh, sorry, I just muted myself. Minus 32x to the third power. Yeah, that's okay. exactly it. Okay, okay. Any questions here from uh, either, either of you two? No, sorry, could you just scroll to the left so I can copy it all down, though? No Thank you. Okay, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so this is pretty much about it here, right? So pretty straightforward examples here. Um, but yeah, just make sure, right, that you don't, uh, you know, just make sure that you don't, um, you know, make this mistake here, right? Okay. Let's look at our first rule. F times G of X. So you guys should be familiar already that this is equal to f of x times g of x, right? This is uh, our first, uh, you know, our first special derivative rule that we're going to be looking at here. Okay, well, let's look at a bit of an example. So let's say, for example, if f of x was x squared and g of x was x cubed, right? The derivative of this whole thing would be the derivative of x to the power of 5, which is, well, 5x to the power of 4, right? 
But if we look at uh, the derivative of each of these guys, it's 2x and 3x squared. And that would be, you know, if we multiply this, that would be 6x to the power of 3. So very clearly, if we do f times g prime, right, this is not equal to f prime times g prime. So let's see if we come up with a way to prove this. And here's how it works. Actually, I want to see it. Jocelyn, do you have any ideas on how we prove it? On what f times g prime is equal to? How would we how would we have to approach this? Uh, I'm not really sure. Not really sure? Sophia, any ideas on your end? I'm not really sure either. Sorry. Not really sure either? Well, Jocelyn, let me ask you this. What is the only way that we have to prove a derivative of something? Like the mathematically. Limits. Yeah, so you got to use the limit approach. So do you remember what that was? Uh, like the one with the like limit as h approaches 0. Of? Uh, f of x plus h minus f of x. Well, it's not just f at this point. It's f times oh, g. Oh, right. So f of x plus h times g of x plus h minus f of x times g times of x. Times. Look good? Yeah. And then all this being divided by h, right? Because uh, x plus h minus, minus x, right? So it's just over h. OK. Then from here, um, also, I do want to, I guess I should make the note at this point. Um, it is acceptable. It is acceptable to just, you know, like cancel out the x and the minus x right away and just write over h. You don't have to do that. I just wrote it the first time around to show you that, like, you know, it's this subtracted by x, which leaves you with just h alone. So typically people will go, go straight into this over h. They won't write the x minus x on the bottom. Okay, okay. Well, any ideas on how to do this? Seems kind of nuts, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and it does. And the problem is you don't really have a way to get a derivative in a sense, right? Because um, the derivative, right, requires you to have, you know, maybe some sort of like x plus h uh, minus f of x over h, right? If you can get this, this will be f prime, right? Or if you can, you know, replace the f's with g's, that will be g prime, right? The problem is they're being multiplied by stuff. So it's really difficult to actually, you know, get anything like that, right? Do you yeah. sort of see where this is going? Mm -hmm. Kind of. Okay. Well, let me ask you. If you have f of x plus h here, you know, and then, you know, times g of x plus h, right? You would like to have a minus f of x, right? That kind of gets paired along with it. Do you see where I'm going with this? Uh, yeah. So if you wanted to be able to factor this out, what would you need alongside it? What would you need alongside this f of x right here? Uh, g of x? Well, Wait. you would need a g of x plus h in order to be able to factor it. Oh, right. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. But the problem is there is no term like this inside of this numerator, right? So if you want to, you know, throw it in, what do you need to do to the numerator as well? Um, in order to not change the value of the numerator. In order, right? Because if you oh, change it... you have to multiply the top and the bottom. Multiply? You subtracted oh. it away. Oh, what do you mean add it again? You have to add it to the numerator as well. So the idea here is if you subtract it from the numerator, you have to add it back in. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then let's take a look at what you have from up here. Hey, how neat. All of this is divided by h. Look good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to split this into two separate fractions. 
Is that allowed? Yeah. Yeah, right? It's perfectly fine because, you know, if we um, if we have the same denominator, right, we can just split it into two different fractions based on, you know, your two different numerators, right? So clearly right here, we have a common factor of g of x plus h. So we can split that out, right? So this is limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x, all being multiplied by g of x plus h over h. Plus, and then over here, is there a common factor over here on the right side? Yeah, f of x. f of x. g of x plus h uh, minus g of x over h times f of x. All right, let's go through left, left to right. What is this? That's the derivative. Of? Uh f prime so f prime there you go right so derivative of f of x or f prime what's this keep in mind limit g of x uh g prime and then just f of x and there you have it There it is. So this proof, right, requires you to have one amazing stroke of genius, right? I would I would never come up with this, right? And I don't expect you to ever come up with this. And that's why I'm not going to make you, you know, do this question on your own, right? But let's. it's important to understand the idea behind it. Why do you want this to happen? Well, the problem with this right here, right? is there's no way to go directly from this to f prime or g prime. So if you want, you know, f prime to show up or whatever, right, you got to have minus f of x times the same exact thing. And then the idea is, well, if you subtract it away, you got to add it back in. And it just so happens that this very nicely works out perfectly for you. So this is our formula, and this is what's called the product rule. f times g prime is equal to f prime g plus g prime f. Any questions here from anyone? Now, let's look back to this example that we showed earlier. Oh, I guess I erased it. Okay, so let's look back at the example where we had f of x, uh, f of x is equal to x squared, and g of x is equal to x cubed. Let's go back to this example here. Okay. Um. So, Sophia, what would f prime? What what would f times g prime be equal to, according to this? Um. It would be. Okay. Well, I have. To... Okay. So it would be x. Um. X to the. Oh wait, no. So I would have to find f prime or x yeah. squared, which is just um, 2 times, OK, so it would be 2x times um, x to the third. So it would be 2x to the fourth, and then plus um, 3x to the third. Third? Um, because what it, oh, like, but when you multiply it with f of x. Oh, okay. Um, even then, third. Um, g. What is g prime? Start there. Start there. What is g prime? Wouldn't g prime also? Oh, it'd be three x to the three x squared. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. So then it would be um three x to the fourth. And that equals 5x to the power of 4, which indeed matches what you expected. Yeah. Okay. Better? Yeah. Okay. So this is what we call the product rule, okay? Um, There is another one here, right? There is another rule here uh, for the quotient rule. The quotient rule, right? 
is f over g prime is equal to f prime g minus g prime f all divided by g squared. So the actual proof here, right, is not one that we'll show here because it's, uh, it's a question that's supposed to be for your homework. So we're not going to worry about it. But this is what it is. Now, if you really wanted to know, generally, the idea is basically you're just doing f times 1 over g prime, right, which ends up being f prime times 1 over g plus, well, what is g prime then in this case? Well, g prime, right, would be negative 1 times 1 over uh, 1 over g squared times f, right? So that's the general idea here. So then if you put all of this, right, um, well, 1 over g, it's 1 over g squared times g prime times f. That's roughly how it works. But in order to understand this, you need to understand chain rule. Sorry, I realized I made a mistake. <laughs> So this is about how it works. Oops, I forgot the square. Um, but uh, don't worry about that. You'll probably prove it with like a, the uh, limit approach or something in your problems. But don't worry about that. If that made no sense, um, I didn't. I yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> just just no, just keep just keep the uh, two rules here, right? So this one here and this one here. Just keep those. Because once you learn about the rules, you'll just use the rules and you'll go through them ever again, basically. Uh, any questions here? All right. Um, let's give you a couple more definitions here, and then we'll call it a bit. Um, remember the trig functions? What's the derivative of this? Sophia? Um, when I just try to plug it back into the equations earlier, or should Which I find one? There's a lot of equations that we found today. Sorry. Um, the n times x to the n minus one but yeah. i don't think that would work yeah yeah because this only works with um this only works when you have this is only this is only like integer power of x or not not an integer power of x but like some power of x right and clearly this is well not that mm -hmm. um so then the very first equation the that limit we, yeah Limit yeah, of... yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm not going to make you do this, but roughly this is this of x plus h minus sine of x over h. Right? This seems really annoying and really difficult, and it, it, to be honest, it is, but generally, what do you have to do here? Do you have an idea? Um, I'm not... Or like, I feel like I know, but I, I don't actually... like. Jocelyn, do you know? Is it like the sum angle identity? This is the angle addition property, yeah. So this is the uh this is the sum of angles thing, yeah. So this is sine of x cosine h plus cosine x sine of h, I think. Minus oh. sine of x. Rings a bell, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um so then from here. Uh, you can sort of, uh, you can sort of, you know, combine these two because they both have sine of x, right? So this becomes limit as h approaches zero of sine of x times cosine h over h, um, plus uh sine of h over h times cosine of x, right? Okay, so what you know about this, right? Um, what you know about this is that um sorry 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 minus one minus one what am i what am i doing okay so um what are these limits equal to um so clearly this limit 
will have no effect on these two, right? So it's just a uh, sine of x times limit as h approaches zero of cosine h minus one over h plus limit as h approaches zero of sine of h over h times cosine of x. I'm not gonna make you do these limits. Um, this is trig limit stuff, which is uh, <laughs> not fun, um, but you'll find that this is equal to zero here and this is equal to one here. So if this is equal to zero, this becomes zero, this becomes cosine of x, so sine prime is equal to cosine. Look good? Yeah, wait, I have a question. Why did you subtract one again? Um, minus sine x here. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I forgot to write it the first time around and I looked back and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, you can find a similar thing for cosine of x, um, but basically cosine prime of x is equal to negative sine of x. Um, if you're ever confused about this, if you ever can't remember, just look up your graphs, right? Just look at your graphs. Sine of x starts from zero and goes upwards, right? That's really bad sine of x, right? And then cosine of x starts from one and goes downwards, right? Until it reaches zero, right? Like, like something like this, right? So if you're ever confused by this, right? Just look at this function, right? Sine of x um, starts at, you know, the fastest speed and then it goes towards a zero, right? And it's increasing, but, uh, and then, you know, it stops and then it starts decreasing, right? Well, if you think about the slopes, the slopes would match perfectly with cosine of x. Whereas cosine of x starts decreasing and decreases faster and faster. Well, that seems like if you took sine and made it negative, that would match, right? So that's that's where that's coming from. Now, the rest of these, you can find out by using formulas. All right, so Sophia, this one I kind of I kind of ran through and I kind of you know skipped a couple steps. You know, these two in particular, I very much skipped. Um, but uh, let's look at one that you should be able to do. What is this equal to? The derivative of tangent. Um, so we'll plug it back into the original. Like, okay, so the limit. No, no, of... no, 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 don't, don't, don't do that. Don't oh. Do that. You don't have to do that here. There's a much better way. Oh, so I can, can I just divide them? Like, what do you mean divide them? Wait, wait, what is the much better way to? I'm asking you, what do you think is the better way? <laughs> um, what do you know about tangent? What is tangent equal to? Well, I meant like divide sine and cosine. Right, right. So this oh, is okay. sine prime, well, this would be, sine over cosine prime, right? Yeah. Is that simple as just saying sine prime over cosine prime? Um, no, it's, you have to put it with the quotient rule. Yeah, you got a quotient rule this. Okay. So a quotient rule here means that it's not sine prime over cosine prime. What is it then? Um, it would be sine prime cosine minus cosine prime sine over cosine squared. Yep, and then this ends up being cosine, this ends up being negative sine. So this ends up being cosine squared plus sine squared over cosine squared, which is equal to? Wait, why did you, how could you like simplify it like that? Sine prime is cosine. Oh, right? oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was <not. laughs> um, so that's one. Over cosine, cosine. squared, which yeah. is secant oh. squared. Yeah. Look good? Yeah. Now, the rest of these, right, you can all do very similarly to how we did over here, right, with um, simplifying into terms of sine and cosine. So it turns out, right, you, you really just need to memorize these two. The rest of them can come via, you know, uh, plugging in, uh, you know, in terms of sine and cosine and going from there. Um, but that's, uh, the, you know, those are the first three. The next three are secant x, um, 
cosecant x and cotangent x. This is equal to secant tangent. So secant x, tangent x. This is equal to negative cosecant x, cotangent x. And this is equal to negative cosecant squared x. But again, right, the proof for these three you can prove on your own, very similarly to how we did here, tangent. Any questions so far? And then there are two others that are unique. Um, so I would recommend just memorizing these. Um, at the bare minimum, memorize these two, and then you can you know calculate these as you need. But bare bare minimum, just memorize them, these two, and then you know the rest you can kind of do whatever. Um, there are two others that just need to be memorized. Uh, e to the power of x, the derivative of this is just e to the power of x. And then the derivative of ln of x is equal to one over x. <laughs> Because you know, normally it's your you know your uh, your x to the power of zero term, right? If you took the derivative of this, this would you know get you a one over x, right? But the problem is you multiply by zero. Well, it turns out there still is a way to do it, and that's the natural log. So that's where this comes from. If you're not familiar with this, uh, actually, Jocelyn, what what does this mean? I wrote ln of x, but you should know what this means, right? Natural law. Which is? Uh, uh, blanking since, you said, since you said it's a log, it's a logarithm a log with a base of? E. Yeah, that's it. So this is a logarithm with base E. Now, I'll be writing it as ln. Um, I will always write this as ln because this is the way that basically all of your classes will have it in. Um. However, this book has chosen to use log. And the problem with that is typically log means base 10. So just keep in mind that in this book, log will refer to you know the natural log that we're familiar with, okay? Um, but yeah, that's about it here. So lots of material that we covered here. Um, but I think primarily, right? I think uh, there are maybe, I guess, uh, four, maybe five really important topics. Topic number one, right? What the, um, what the, what the uh, limit definition of a derivative is right here. That's number one. And then we showed a couple of examples where we calculated using that. Number two, um, understanding, you know, that uh, we have this faster way to find a limit. Uh, to, no, 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 to find a derivative, right? Where you don't have to, we don't have to memorize that approach all of the time. Number three, the uh, product and the quotient rules. And then number four, the derivatives of, of trigonometric functions. So these are um, the four big ideas that we covered here today. Now, that's pretty much sections 3.1 through 3.3 .3 in the textbook. Um, so I'll be posting that, I guess. And then um, that will be. Uh, our homework here for today. But that's going to be it here for today. Um, thanks, everyone. I know I know it seems a little bit scattered, um, but that's because I'm trying to like pull the important parts that I feel like and then like skip parts that I think aren't as necessary. Um, so that's kind of why uh, I'm jumping a little bit here and there. But I hope um, for the most part, I've uh, I haven't caused too much confusion because I know that uh, I know we haven't covered limits at all in this class. But the idea is that um, if you guys have all seen it before, then at, at the very least, the approaches that we're using here shouldn't be too hard to follow. Um, but yeah, um, always though, if you guys have any questions, right, um, feel free to just always let me know, right, and then I can, um, you know, I can always answer. Um, so if there's anything that you know didn't exactly make sense or any any like step in my, you know, a step that I took that um, you guys don't understand, just let me know, okay. Um, if you guys run into any questions over you know, um, over the week or if there's anything that you guys you know don't remember or anything like that, um, we there are office hours that I run. So that basically just means that you can come in during an hour and just you know ask any questions that you might have. That is on Wednesdays, uh, Wednesday nights. Um, I can't remember exactly when, but that's that's the day it is. I think it's um Wednesday. Uh, 7 to 8 p.m. U.S. Central Time. So if you guys are on 
uh, the Pacific, that is 5 to 6 p.m. Right. But if you guys don't have any questions, then that's going to be it here for today. And I'll see you guys next time, wherever, whenever that is. Okay, thank you. See you uh, next time. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.